Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, there's a good chance you're not familiar with today's guest, and that's because he is busy in Tupelo, Mississippi, healing people with plant-based nutrition in the Deep South, also known as the Stroke Belt, also known as the Bible Belt. Not, well, it's the Bible Belt, but it's also the Bacon Belt. So there's a lot of belts <laughs> there, and I can't wait for you to meet him. I'm meeting him for the first time. I heard about him from Shane, who's been on the show many times, of Shane and Simple. They're both in Mississippi. Please welcome Dr. Rich McCarty. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks for taking the time to do the show. I know you're a busy working doctor. Glad to be here. Happy to happy to participate. So how the heck does somebody become plant-based when they're in the South? Not easily. Uh, first, I would start out. So it's, uh, it is definitely more of a process having lived different places. Um, it is, it is one small change at a time as I, as I tell my patients. So there's, you don't have the big steps like you see out on the West coast and in some of the, uh, areas like Colorado, Seattle. Um, this is, uh, this is very much a different culture if you've ever been down here. Um, I've been to, I don't know if this is considered the deep South, but I've been to Atlanta. I've been to New Orleans. I think that's about it for me. Uh, South Carolina. Yes. Well, so New Orleans is a unique ecosystem in its own, which I love because I was born there, but, um, and they have great food. Uh, probably most food people partake is not the food we recommend, but you can find um, some good plant-based dishes in New Orleans as well. Right. But how did you personally, I'm assuming you're plant-based, but if you're not, that's I, okay too. How did you become a plant-based doctor? You went to osteopathic medical school. I'm guessing they didn't recommend it to you then. No, they did not. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, anybody who takes a traditional track toward any type of medicine, whether it's allopathic or osteopathic, um, I probably maybe had one nutrition course, which I probably skipped uh, to study something else. And I, fortunately, that is changing. Um, so, you know, with the advent of American College of Lifestyle Medicine, some of these different types of tracks that is very much more on the radar than when I went through. But to get back to your original question is, so I went through osteopathic medical school in the Midwest, which is obviously that's beef country. Um, so definitely not vegetable country. And so, you know, fortunately I was privy to have a mother who was more health oriented when I grew up. So for example, instead of eating Apple Jackson Fruit Loops, she fed me grape nuts. And so <laughs> I um, remember those. Those were so crunchy. It's like, oh, they my were. I, I had to let them sit there for a while. I couldn't. I go would hear them in it. my ears when I would eat them. It was and I, and I did like them, but I put a ton of sugar on them. But I did. Enjoy uh, them. Same here. So so in order to, to in order to get those down, you had to had to add a little extra sugar. So um, so that I think that kind of put it on my radar. She was very active. She was a runner. Um, and so she, um, uh, she kind of opened my eyes in certain ways. And so I, I had a good upbringing in that standpoint. And then, you know, I've always been open to just, I, I would say things outside of traditional medicine, uh, whether that's, you know, Eastern medicine, whether that's, you know, from a nutritional standpoint and, you know, I guess I could go back and say, I got introduced during residency, um, I came across one of uh, Joel Furman's books and so eat to live. And so that, that really opened my eyes. And then I had a patient come in who had just gotten two heart stents and he was actually a physician that I knew he was an ophthalmologist in the area. And he, he said, look, I just got finished reading this book called the China study. You've got to read it. And so I was like, okay, you know, I was like, sure. He goes, he was like, if I had known this, I would have never gotten these two heart stents. And I was like, okay. So I read that book and that was pretty much it. Um, after I read that book, it just, I, I couldn't get enough information. So I just have continued to pursue that since that time. So, you know, I mean, that's interesting because when, you know, you, you have different people have different reasons be, be, for adopting a plant-based or vegan diet. Uh, the environment is a fairly new reason. When I went vegan 47 years ago, we 
didn't even talk about health. It was really <laughs> the animals. But that book, because I've interviewed, I would say over 2000 people now, mostly doctors. And that is, it seems to be the entry point for so many of them. And yet others read the book, doctors included, that don't make the change or, or won't read the book. So what do you think is the determining factor, whether or not somebody reads the book and believes what the book says? Because I've had, I don't want to say who it is. I don't need people to find that episode, but I've had people on the show that, that dismiss that book, believe it or not. I believe it. Um, so I, I think to me, I think the China study for me was more empirically based academic. So I think that's what drew me in. I mean, I think most people with a, I'd say the majority of people with a medical background, just based off training, we look at things through a kind of science-based, empirically based um, perspective. And so from my standpoint, it also just kind of made sense. Um you know, when you look at where our country is, um, I mean, we're, we're beyond a crisis. Uh, we've been in a crisis for decades. Um, I would say we're really, we're on a kind of a meltdown course. Um, if you look at, you know, the current statistics, you know, it, it's it's staggering. And, and obviously you don't really see that pushed much in the media uh and the media is a whole different <laughs> whole different topic but i would say when you look at uh, the fact that you know 6 out of 10 people have at least one chronic disease you know 4 out of 10 have 2 plus 1 out of 3 people are pre-diabetic um 1 out of 4 to 5 people are diabetic um and i think the thing that scares me the most there was this article and i really i, I shared this with Shane is it was an article out of the New, New England Journal of Medicine, which is typically, you know, well-respected and puts out some good stuff. So it was the, it was basically a U.S. perspective on the state level of obesity and morbid obesity by 2030. Okay, so it was kind of that projection. And so basically what it estimated by 2030, it estimates one out of two people will be obese. And in, in what one year, out, what, wait, what year will one out of two be obese? So 2030. 2030. So that's not, that's not far off. So that's six years. Wow. I'll be, I'll be so, 70. I'll be 70. And every other person will be obese. And obese means BMI greater than 30. If I'm that's not. That's correct. So, so one out of two people will be obese, but more concerning one out of four of those people will be morbidly obese, which is a BMI of 40 or greater. And then they stated the, the most common BMI of, I think it was women, non-Hispanic Blacks, and low-income adults will be a BMI of greater than 40 or morbid obesity. So and it doesn't say how many will be overweight, right? Because if if one out of two is obese, the one that isn't could still be overweight. Well, so, I would say 75% of people are either in this country are either overweight or obese right now. Right. But we have a cure now, don't we, Ozempic, right? Oh, let me yeah. tell you. Um, it, it is I, I, it is a trillion dollar drug at that. Um, that is, yes, it, it's... Uh, Ooh, but that's a that's a whole another topic in itself. Now, are but, you are you are your patients asking for it? Are you prescribing it? And how do you feel about it? I, I mean, I could finance a good vacation with the samples we get at the clinic. So I, I could I could sell those to every housewife in my neighborhood, and that would that would pay for a nice vacation. Um, so yes, it is. It's like anything else. I mean, Ozempic is just kind of the, you know, the next, you know, uh, panacea of, of weight loss and health. I mean, it's, you know, I don't know if you remember when Olene came out, um, that, that, that stuff was awful. Is that the uh, one that caused anal leakage? It did. I mean, I mean, okay, who would just, no, and, and you know, funny because when they, they were making potato chips, I think it was with and it's like, you know, I'm sure I eat a I eat a whole food plant exclusive, lower sure. fat diet. And so of course I would like a baked chip over a fried chip. But man, sure. I'm a potato chip bag warning you that if you eat this, you could have anal leakage. I mean, come on. 
That's so I don't funny. I don't think it gets more graphic than that. <laughs> I mean, that is just crazy. Well, you look like you're in really good shape. And how how many years ago did you adopt a plant-based diet after reading the China study? Was it overnight? Was it gradual? If you have like a family, uh, if you are able to tell us, like, did they join you in this journey? So I think when I started out, so it's been, I guess, almost 20 years. And 20, so amazing. And, in your, and you've been working as a doctor the whole time in Mississippi with this knowledge. Mm, yeah. So it, it really started kind of during my, my residency training. And so I, I just adopted I, at that point, I could not refute the evidence and the potential lifelong health benefits. So I said, I mean, obviously, if I'm going to preach it, I've got to live it. And so I, I went, I mean, it was definitely a transition and I have a lovely wife um, and I have three boys. And so, so obviously um, I think like anything with any children, you don't force things. Um, you basically try, I've always tried to educate them on the benefits. And what I, what I would say is, my three boys are much healthier than I was at their age. Now, they are not by any means completely plant-based. I will say my middle son is my star pupil. He is, he comes the closest, he recognizes that, um, and he is, he is very dedicated um, when it comes to, you know, using plant-based protein powder. Obviously, you know, I'd love to say, um, you know, he does everything just whole food plant-based, but that's not realistic, uh, probably as a senior in high school. So, so again, I think you well, have to have the he right. If you're a senior in high school and you've been doing this 20 years, he wasn't born when you started. So my oldest is 21. So he um, was born at the time. Okay. Right. Right. So, so my, so, uh, so yeah. So, so again, I think with, with my children and, and I think with my patients, you know, I tried to have, realistic expectations. I tried to educate them on the benefits and give them examples and show them a real world reality of those people who don't, because that's what I see every day with clinic. I see those people who make choices that, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, keep them in a poor state of health. What percentage, Dr. Rich, of your patients present to you with diseases that you could attribute to lifestyle? I would say at least 80%. Wow. And would their disease either be reversed or completely wiped out if they were to eat more the way you recommend? Without a doubt. I think, you know, there was a good little publication by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So basically, you know, they attributed three things to kind of the main drivers of the chronic disease we currently encounter today. And so one would obviously be diet. The second would be a sedentary lifestyle. And the third would be smoking. So basically what they said was you eliminate those three factors, you reduce diabetes by 80%, you reduce heart disease and stroke by 80% and cancer by 40%. So if you could culminate that in a pill, both you and I could retire and work from anywhere we wanted to. So, so again, there is a pill. It's just not in pill format um, is what I would say. So was it easier? Um, is your wife plant-based? She is not a hundred percent plant-based. Um, you know, we have a good marriage. Uh, so, <laughs> and you want to keep so it that like way, anything, right? <laughs> you, you pick, you pick your battles um, to keep the harmony amongst uh, the household. Does she, does she cook plant-based for you though, or the family? Or how, yes, how, I does. don't mean to get she too does. personally personal. She does. She's married to a doctor. I love how you said, if you're going to preach it, you better live it, which is fantastic. But that's, um, that's great that, you know, that you're doing what you're doing. When they come to you, the patients, do they have any clue that the diseases they're presenting with have anything to do with lifestyle? Typically, no. So, so the, it is, I think one of the things, especially with where our practice in Mississippi, um, obviously, you know, it is the second unhealthiest state in the U S which usually sometimes it's first, sometimes it's second. So we, what, we is kinda, second? what is second? That's right. Well, so 
I mean, we are currently second. West Virginia is currently the unhealthiest state in the U.S. We are number two. Um, and, you know, currently 40 percent of our adults in Mississippi are obese. So we're all, you know, we're, we're closing in on that 50 percent mark. Um, we lead the nation as far as diabetes, heart disease, chronic kidney disease. And I think we come in second um, with, I think, stroke, hypertension. So, so again, we are a hotbed for chronic disease, um, to say the least. And obviously, some of that's cultural. Some of that's what they grew up on. So, I mean, you look at, we're very much a meat and potatoes part of the country. So um, everybody thinks there has to be a meat and then there has to be, you know, a starch and maybe some vegetables. And then obviously dessert is always, always a, a, a big one in the South. And so, you know, like anything, it, it's changing that perspective. And, you know, you have to, you have to approach that in a realistic expectation. So for most of these patients, I'm heavy on education. I'm heavy on education. So we, we start with, really educating them on the benefits in my exam room to have lots of information. I also have multiple soda bottles, um, juice bottles, and I, I put in the equivalent of sugar that would actually be in the liquid. So, so that's a great conversation starter because most people say, well, what's in those bottles? Is it, is it salt? And I said, no, it's not salt. Um, it's the other white. Uh, so it's sugar. And so, you know, just like anything else, the visualization of how much sugar is just in a 12 ounce Coke, which would be essentially 10 teaspoons, shocks people. They have no idea how much sugar they're taking in. So, I mean, when you look at your typical Starbucks run, I mean, you're putting in, I mean, at least 18 to 20 teaspoons of sugar in whatever tasty beverage you pick up. So, so again, I think, I think visualization is part of the key. Because I think in one of your podcasts, they made some reference how you would when you, you know, one of your core principles is that of nutritional and um, calorie density. So mm -hmm. so when you give those examples of, hey, this is an apple, this is, you know, apple sauce, this is apple juice, the difference between those three mediums makes a big difference. So so, again, I think a lot of it is people just don't don't know. And it's, you know, that's I think that's in my opinion, not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I think that's on purpose. Um, so so what I explain to people is food is the biggest addiction out there. It trumps alcohol. It trumps, you know, street drugs, cocaine, methamphetamines. Those don't even come close to the type of damage food in itself does and the type of food we provide. So as you know, 60 to 70 percent of what people are consume are either processed or ultra processed foods. So far from a whole food plant based diet. Yeah, I, I thank you for acknowledging that. I don't like to argue with guests, but I have a lot of medical doctors that come on and just don't acknowledge food as an addiction. And that's crazy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. So that would have been, a, are you at your office now? Cause that would be a great visual to see those bottles or maybe you can send me a, a, a shot and we could somehow. I will. I would definitely send that to you. Make, yeah. make it the thumbnail. So, so 20 years eating plants and have you noticed any difference in, in your own health or the way you feel? Um, I mean, obviously there was definitely that transition. Everybody has a transition once they go from eating more of a standard American diet to a whole food plant base. But I, I guess in that sense, I've been doing it so long. I just I always feel good. <laughs> I, mean, I don't, I don't really have complaints. Um, and you know, the other thing is, is I'm finishing up, uh, Michael Gregor's new book, how not to age and which is, which is good. And so, you know, when you change what you put into your body, obviously everything else changes with it. So, I mean, for example, um, I will be 50 this year. Um, well, you, you look, first of all, I was going to say you look a lot younger and you also look very fit. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I think, you know, when you look at just simply from an aging perspective, I think a whole food plant-based diet makes a huge difference. 
Um, not only does it support the things that you want to do to slow the aging process, but it also feeds all the things that help fight chronic disease, cancer. So, so again, I think, I think it can be as simple as if you just want to feel good and feel yourself, then obviously a whole food plant-based diet has a lot to offer. Um, you know, I think, for example, I saw a patient in the other day um, and he is one of your, in reference to Ozempic. Now, this is this is a patient who he uh, his job is he operates large machinery like, you know, a backhoe or a bulldozer. And I've been working with him over the past few years and probably his previous visit. I said, look, I said, you know, if we don't change something now, then your life will be short lived. You've got so much going on in your body. You've got so much metabolic dysfunction. You're morbidly obese. You can barely get around. You have chronic back pain and knee pain. Um, and I said, you're only 46. So, so he, this is where I did use Ozempic. So again, I'm not promoting Ozempic, but I think like anything else, I go back to setting realistic expectations. I use these things as a tool to help get people to a better place. But if you can get them to that place, then you don't have to sell them on anything. So, so I saw him back just this week. He was down 60 pounds. And now that wasn't just from those Olympics. So I'm not, I'm not owing that. I'm saying that was a tool he changed the way he lived his life. He changed his lifestyle and he changed what he was eating on a daily basis. He switched more to whole food plant-based. Now he didn't go whole food plant-based, but he switched to whole foods, salads. You know, he got away from the processed foods. He doesn't consume sugar-based beverages and he looked like a different person. So, so that is a patient I don't have to sell anymore. He will never go back to the way he was. He feels so much better. And so if you could just get people to get a little traction, it sells itself. So that's what I would say. Yeah. The thing is, is that you need, they, they need a little bit of time to experience the difference on, on how they feel, but isn't it like pretty much sacrilegious to not drink sweet tea if you live in the South? Thankfully I've never liked sweet tea. Good. <laughs> um, Yes. Well, I call sweet tea the soda of the South, just without carbonation. That's what it is. So it's just it's just the soda of the South. And so, again, when I'm counseling patients, I say, you know, of course, I push them away from all sugar based beverages. But I said that includes sweet tea. Mm -hmm. um, and so so we can we can be clear. So so, again, I like anything, it's. People don't want to feel that way. People don't want to be obese. They don't want to be on multiple medications. I mean, so by default, I think most people should say they just don't know any better and they don't have someone to really educate them and explain and give them direction. So most of the healthcare provided, go ahead. Uh, sorry, sorry, but I was thinking they don't, they don't have anyone modeling it for them either. Like, are you familiar with Dr. Dean Warnish? And how he, oh. talks about, he talks about, and so <laughs> Dr. Sassel, they talk about the obese, obesity contagion that you're more like, I think I said the word wrong, but you're more likely to be overweight or obese if your friend's friend is rather than oh. your family. And they, they, they don't like you, you are modeling good health and fitness, but if, if everybody in your family is like that, you, you don't have a reference for another way. You know what I mean? Correct. Correct. And, and you, your reference also goes to, I think what you've said in the past about community. You've got to change your community or, or, or like your parents always, always say you are who you hang around with. It can right. be as that simple. Yep. Ab absolutely. Yep. And you said that, you, that your mom kind of modeled it early, but just, just the simple thing of grape nuts versus Apple Jacks. Like you kind of like got the message sure. a little bit early on that some foods are less healthy than other foods. Right. And so, and for example, so when, when my boys usually hit about age 13 or 14, I would start taking them with me to the gym. So again, I would always try to promote good habits. I said, this is a good habit for life. 
um, not just for your health, but also it's a good kind of stress reliever. So if it's been a long day, it's good to go out to the gym. It's good to go for a run. So I think all those things um, play a role. So obviously, as big of an advocate as I am for a whole food plant-based diet, um, that's just one piece of this puzzle. There's so many other things. If you're looking for a sense of wellness from a physical functional standpoint and from a spiritual standpoint in meditation. So, so again, you can still be following a whole food plant-based diet and still struggle in so many ways if you don't have those other components. Yeah. Well, but the thing is about, but it starts with the food, right? I mean, if oh, you, I agree. No, no. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if, cause if you have somebody that's coming with you with all these multiple diseases, I'm guessing that you, you mentioned the food before, like, Hey, oh, cause, without a doubt. Cause, cause just going to the gym is not going to be the answer for a lot of people, for most people, I would say. Well, um, as you know, that's not the main, main driver of weight loss. And the other, the other important thing I try to point out to people is fit as in physically fit doesn't always mean healthy. There are plenty of physically fit people who have heart attacks, who have, you know, hypertension, who have a lot of chronic disease if they're not feeding that body the appropriate nutrition. Why and how did the South historically is known for not, not being as healthy? Like, I, how, how did that? Who started that? Who did this to you? Hmm. I, don't know, that's a, I mean, obviously that kind of goes way back. I mean, that could, I, I hate to just say, I guess this is why the, it is. But I mean, obviously I think like the South, I mean, food has always been a very much a focal point. Um, and I also think, you know, through the transitions, I'm assuming through the transitions through the eras and the, the centuries that, you know, this has not always been, you know, when you look at, post-Civil War, you, you know, there was very much a rebuilding. So I think, you know, economically things were tough. So what, what was cheap? Well, we know cheap ingredients and well, I take that back. So that, that can be a bit misleading. I would say, you know, when you look at what maybe they had access to flour, sugar, you know, the basics that, you know, that started to create some of that. Um, but it's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's interesting. So, I, I mean, obviously, each culture has things they go around. And, you know, when I tell people that I haven't had, you know, any meat for 20 years, they just kind of look at me like I live on Mars. Um, it's just like, how, how is that possible? Um, and yeah. so, so, again, it all depends where somebody starts their journey. Um, you can't just kind of come in there. And, and and this is where I struggle with some of the what I call pioneers, some of the people who really kind of get the headlines. You know, they just say, well, just just eat plants. It's not always that simple in in the real world. I mean, yes, it's that simple. But, you know, when you're dealing with someone who has, you know, a lack of experience, a lack of education, a lack of resources, then that's not going to be first and foremost on their radar. So, so it's, it's not that simple. And I think the other thing I'd like to point out about that is, is that, and so my passion is just bringing this to the forefront, but also I think there are some other things. So why did I get a lifestyle medicine certification? Because it was a tool. It was another tool that added knowledge to my ability to help people. Why did I do a functional medicine course? Well, because it was a tool. And so the interesting thing is, is um, I'll have, I mean, I've been doing this long enough to where people seek me out. Um, as far as plant-based nutrition, I have lots of just plant-based um, patients and I have transitioned people to plant-based and some of it has come for that very example, when I had someone come in, he was a engineer, so he's very technical. Um, he had had two heart stents. He went and followed up at the local um, cardiology clinic. And of course he had been put in on the traditional therapy, which is gonna be a statin, uh, an aspirin and a beta blocker. And so he, he went for his follow-up. He goes, okay, I, I understand 
you have started me on this medication, but I want to know what else I can do to reduce my future risk of another cardiovascular event and hopefully to regress the disease I already have. And the response he got was, well, this is all you can really do. And so he was like, well, I'm not happy with that answer. So, so I got him as a patient. He has been complete, I'll say, plant exclusive, like you like to use, um, for, I want to say, almost two years now. And it has radically changed. His mindset has radically changed, um, I think, his long-term outcome. So it's been it's been been great. So so again, you have I have, I have case examples like that too. I have case examples like I get a family just to change one of the simple starches at supper with a green or a vegetable. So it, it can start out that way. Um, so I mean, so there are a lot of things out there. But I think the other modality which I've I've been doing over the past years, I do a lot of food allergy testing out of my clinic. So sometimes healthy foods may not be healthy for your body. So depending on what you're struggling with, sometimes you can react to healthy foods in a unfavorable way. So, so I think that that's the other thing to remember. It, it doesn't apply to everybody, but depending on what you're struggling with, you, um, I have, become to kind of realize that, you know, just like anybody, we all have things we react to. Now, we may not be aware of it and our body may compensate for it, but I've also made a lot of good gains um, in that as far as, so for example, I did, I finally did some food, this food and allergy testing I do out of my clinic and I was highly reactive to kidney and pinto beans. Now, if you ask me, are those unhealthy? Of course they're not. Of course they're healthy for you, but they weren't healthy for my body. So by excluding those, that's there's some benefit to that. So so yeah, there just there's so many things out there now that I think we have access to that can really help a patient's state of health. Um, it's you know I think it's exciting, um, but at the same time we know what really drives the boat is nutrition. So whole food plant-based nutrition. So again, not to take away from that, but I think there, and when I get into things like I just told you, that's really more when I'm trying to tweak a person's level of health. If, if something's just not right, we're missing something. Um, that's really what I try to do. Nice. Is it just me or do people tell you, you look like Ted Lasso? <laughs> That's the first. Uh, so, so um, haven't had that one before, but well, yeah, because you kind of look like Jason Sudeikis. Some of the people are saying <laughs> other actors like Matthew Broderick had helped. Have you been told you look like someone? Um, so, I mean, I've had different comments here and there. Not, not that <laughs> I will say in that sense, but but I again, um, I you know, I just think that I think there's there's a lot of opportunity. That's what I would say. So I think part of that's why I feel like I came back. Um, I think that family is very important to me. Um, so my parents live where I practice. Uh, my wife is about from a little town, 45 minutes North from here. We met in college. And so, so again, um, is, as bad as things may seem when you look at the statistics, I think that just means more opportunity to help people. And I think that's always a positive. So in Mississippi, other than you and Shane and the patients that are transitioning, thanks to you, is there even a, a vegan community or plant-based community, meetups, veg fests, restaurants? So good question. Um, so we do have one of my patients who, uh, transitioned to a completely plant exclusive diet, did start a Facebook It's kind of Northeast Mississippi whole food plant based diet. So, so she, she did start that. She, she was a school teacher, um, at the school where my boys went. 
Um, and so uh, you got that. You have in Jackson, Mississippi, um, there is a um, lifestyle medicine clinic at the University of Mississippi. So you do have these pockets of places um, that where these things are offered, but they are definitely few and far between. So, so we do have locally, we have one place, which is kind of like a bowl place where you can do different bowls, rices, different vegetables. You know, of course they serve things like ahi tuna and, you know, so things that also uh, are attractive to people. Um, so we have something like that. And then we have another place that does bowls like an acai bowl when you could put, you know, granola, almond butter, different fruits on it. So, so when we have those things, I really try to promote those with my patients. So I have different printouts that list, you know, different local places where they can get plant-based meals. Now I will say it's few and far between. And so the other thing I recommend for patients is before they go out is they go ahead and eat. So I said, typically you can find something plant-based as an appetizer. Um, so again, it doesn't prevent them from going out and they can still enjoy that. But I just, you know, I try to say, if that's going to be the case, you know, you're where we live, your options are going to be limited. So go ahead and eat before you go out to a degree. And then you can get something small and do it that way. Now, some of the restaurants, some of the higher end restaurants are willing to entertain. Like if you say you're plant-based, they will fix you something plant based. So that's that's always nice. Um, but but the reality is we're very much in the minority. Um, so even if you were to open a plant based, you know, restaurant, it would be a hard go. Yeah. You know, it's funny when I was in the South and I'm only thinking I've only been there a couple of times. You know, we have gro regular grocery stores, you know, the aisles so that it'll say what's there, you know, like baking items or dog food. And in the South, it actually had a bacon aisle, like a whole <laughs> aisle just devoted to bacon. Oh, but, uh, it's uh, so that's I mean, I've seen sometimes at the clinic when people bring they'll have bacon donuts. So it's a donut with bacon. I mean, <laughs> I don't think you could get any more <laughs> unhealthy than a, a donut with bacon. Um, but, but they exist. Uh, so yeah, it, it's obviously it's, it's very interesting. Um, it's again, there is, like I like to say, there's a lot of opportunity um, to change some of this, but uh, you know, I, I think that there are things, things are changing. So for example, you know, one of probably you could say one of the top, health food places here would be like a Chipotle. <laughs> so, so you could get anything you wanted minus the meat. Um, so that's, you know, that's one option I recommend for my patients. I don't know if you're familiar with the happy cow app. Absolutely. Yes. So, so that's, so I really push that for patients so you can travel. Um, one of the new apps that's really caught fire is um, called the Yuka app, Y-U-K-A. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. I'm not. I'll look it up. What does it do? So this is for what I would like to say my beginners or my starters. So all this does is you can scan any label. And of course, if you're scanning labels, you're not really eating healthy. But again, baby steps and having the right expectations. But you can scan a label and it breaks everything down to calories, salt content. Right. Yeah, I just um, found it. It's right here. And I believe yep. it's free. Yes, exactly. And so another positive for my patients. And so it also shows the sugar content and it kind of gives it a rating. Um, it also gives alternatives, which you can take. And I've looked at some of the alternatives. Um, I don't know if I agree with all of them, <laughs> but again, it is a start. So obviously most people always have their phones. So you've got to be somewhat technologically savvy you know, in today's age, because use what resources you have. So that's why I will do that. That's why I'm a big pusher of documentaries. Um, you know, hey, I know you watch YouTube. I mean, I know you watch um, Amazon Prime. I know you watch Netflix. So here's a list of documentaries you ought to watch. Um, so, so again, you just have to use those things that are available, um, like anything. So when you made your transition 20 years ago, how difficult or how easy it was 
was it? And is there anything from your previous diet that you miss? So, I mean, I think any transition is a challenge because it requires habit and behavior change. That's your biggest hurdle. So habit and behavior change, like anything, is where I think people struggle. And then the other, as you're... <laughs> as you're what I, I've kind of picked up on is one of your famous little colloquialisms is if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. So, so again, if you, hey, you're right. Okay. <laughs> I had to get up because I, I, my birthday was last Friday and look what somebody made me. Isn't it? Beautiful? I like it. It's so, I, I love, I, I have, I have my whole house is colorful because I love art like Leonid Afromov and, uh, sure. And, and look at this. I mean, isn't this great? That's awesome. And you know what? Yeah. It's true. I, you know, it really is true. I agree. hundred percent. When I, when I heard, when I heard that your phrase and, and as you you seem to be popular, I listened to one of the podcasts where Rip Esselton interviewed you and he, he, he kind of made the same comments. Like you've got all these great little witty sayings that, but, but they have, they hold a lot of truth. Um, so, so uh, like the why that makes you cry. Um, so I was like, you know, those, that, those I can't are... take credit for that. I learned that from doc, a local doctor, Dr. Roseanne Elvier, who's a wonderful plant-based doctor at Stanford and UC Davis. It's still great though. It's yeah. still great. So ha, ha, wherever it came from, um, it's, it's still a good, good little one-liner. So, but, um, so, so I would say definitely transition wise, I think it was just, changing it's really just the behavior and habit change because like anything you're used to doing what you're used to do and with that transition it's a complete change of habits what you have in your house and how you cook what you're using to cook um so so i, I think that's my biggest hurdle do i miss anything i think what i would say is i really don't i, I think they are you know, just like smells from your childhood, your mom cooking something or, you know, those smells bring back good memories, but definitely not something I would want to eat. Um, so, so I would, I guess I would say it that way. So I, I don't really miss anything. I, I think where, where that challenge would get into is certain, probably certain recipes or, um, things in the past that were made, which may have had like a little egg in it or something like that. So, so again, maybe something in that form or fashion, but really all you have to do there is find the replacement, you know, find, find the adjustment to get to the same place um, is what I would say. Nice. So you, you probably know if you've ever watched any episode, you're going to get this question. What does Dr. Rich eat in a day? So, so kind of like you, I, I'm not a big breakfast eater. Um, I just, so if I do, if I do do a um, breakfast, typically it's going to be a smoothie. Um, it's quick. Um, I don't really, like I said, I don't really like to eat. So, so what's in my smoothie when I make it? Um, so I will do the base is water. Um, and then I use a, um, pea base protein. So I use Vega protein makes a good pea base protein that I use. Um, and then I will put in a tablespoon of wheat germ. And so that comes from uh, Dr. Greger's new book, How Not to Age. So it contains what's called spermidine in it. Um, so sper spermidine is very good from a cognitive uh, aging standpoint. So I put that in, I put two keeping, I guess, tablespoons of um, gluten-free oats um, just to add a little fiber. Of course, that has a little bit of oil in it, as you all know. And then um, I will add a, a small portion of a um, berry-based medley. So it usually consists of blueberries, raspberries, and strawberries. And then I will add some form of spinach, kale, uh, Swiss chard, into that and I blend it up and I hit the road. Um, so that's, that's usually what I would do in a morning. If it's on the weekend, um, my, one of my big favorites is to make like an acai bowl or some kind of uh, bowl in that, that 
form fashion, which would include, you know, just fresh fruit, almond butter, uh, maybe a little granola. But I will say you really caught my interest about vegetables for breakfast. Um, that is something that, well, and I, I think it was a great point because personally, I've never thought about it that way. And so, so again, I totally agree. If you, you look at the typical standard American breakfast, and even if it's not standard American, it's going to be high carb, a good bit of sugar. And when you start to look outside of the U S at other countries, most countries have vegetables for breakfast. And so when you, you know, when you looking at it from your nutrient dense first calorie dense, it makes perfect sense. And really it's just a mindset change. So, you know, I couldn't eat vegetables for breakfast. Well, why couldn't you eat them for lunch and dinner? So what really is the difference between those? There, there is no difference. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just, I, I will applaud you. I think, I think that was a great point. Well, thank you. Because um, so you, know, you, you wouldn't believe how many people like just, I don't want to say ostracize me, but just like just thought I was ridiculous when I was basically doing what I saw in other parts of the world. I wasn't like making this up. I mean, when I go teach in Mexico, guess what? There is vegetables at breakfast because there's beans at breakfast, there's tortillas, and they're not and they're putting, you know, cabbage and and and, and cilantro and lettuce and, and things like that on it. When I was in Japan, the, the, I mean, that's where I learned it. And this was 1994. Sure. I didn't, I, and I mean, then I started researching it and all the healthier countries, they weren't just eat, people think I just eat vegetables for breakfast. No, I eat vegetables and starch, but the, all the healthy countries were eating it as part of their breakfast. Even some of the less healthy countries, like in, in Scandinavia, where they have, they're known for having very high cholesterol, they were eating sure like herring on pumpernickel bread, but guess what? There was right. cucumber and onion and tomato on it. So this is not a, you know, I, I didn't just make this up. No, right. No, I, I, I was just really applauding you because I thought it was a great point. And even one that I had not really thought deep about, but once you raised the point, I was like, well, that makes perfect sense. And I need to integrate that more into my own routine um, just because I, I, I just don't, I don't really think about it. And, and I think some of that is. Enough vegetables. If you're only eating vegetables at lunch and dinner, um, I mean, and, and some people only eat lunch and dinner like me, but it's even my husband who is no food addictions trim ever since we thought about this concept, which was actually January 2nd, remember the day we started January mm -hmm. 2nd. 2012, he always eats a huge amount of steamed greens before he eats whatever he eats, which is usually like oatmeal and fruit or cereal, you know, sure. or dried cereal and fruit, because he realizes he can't get enough fiber or get enough vegetables if he You're just right. lays it for the other meals. And so if somebody's having a smoothie, or if they're putting greens in, guess what? That's vegetables for breakfast. It is. It is. Yeah. It is. That, so that's, uh, so, so that, that's a good one. So Lunch is a little trickier. Usually I have to bring lunch. Now, what I will say, because I've been plant-based for so long, you know, typically in doctor's offices, they will, drug reps bring food. And so I've been doing this so long, they bring me a plant-based meal. Um, now, it doesn't always meet the criteria of a whole food plant-based meal, but but they will bring me always, it usually consists of salads, different vegetables, um, like that. So, so typically... Um, that's what I'll do. I'll, I'll do some piece of fruit at lunch. Um, I do have some, and this is where probably I will cheat a little bit when you look at, when I get into probably a little more fat content. Um, and that's with some of the kind of vegan based protein bars, which I struggle with because a lot of those, you can pick those apart. They're not always the best but again sometimes i'm just basically you know i'll work through lunch and, and really it's just kind of sustenance in that sense um so either i'm bringing something from the night before um or i you know get provided some other kind of plant base which is usually going to be consistent of a salad or just basic vegetables um and fruits and then um for dinner it's going to be you know some whole food plant-based prepared dish, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, one of the, one of the things I like is the uh, bell peppers filled with different vegetables, you know, quinoa rice. Um, we will do that a lot. Um, and so we do lots of kind of 
one of my favorite things to make is, and this is where my middle son comes into play because he'll actually eat two of them. Um, I love to make uh, these black bean sweet potato burgers. Um, so it consists sweet potatoes, black beans, got a little oats to kind of hold some things together. I will caramelize some onions, put that on top with some avocado. Um, and that's, that's, that's a lot of fun. So that's kind of nice. And like you mentioned, when you kind of, you want to like anything on the weekends, if you can batch bake. So I'll make additional patties that I can just come home, slip those out and go, go to town. So I always make my smoky sweet potato burgers and I just keep them in the freezer yep. at all times and I can have a really quick meal. Do you do any of your own cooking and do you have my two favorite appliances, the Instant Pot and the Air Fryer? We have both. So, yes, yes, those those come in handy, uh, very much so. So we uh, we make use of that. Obviously, we have food processor, um, we have a Vitamixer. We, you know, so we we have, you know, put together a lot of different things um, over time. And so, yeah, that it, it makes it very, very simple. Nice. Uh, where do you stand on SOS free? Not that you have to be, but um, do, you, do you minimize the sugar, oil and salt? Yes. So, I mean, as you've made in previous points of podcasts, when you look at the calorie density and I, and I bring that up to my patients. So especially when you're sauteing vegetables, um, I will use a low salt based vegetable broth. Um, and, you know, you can use water too. So I've used water as well. It just depends. But I try to minimize the use of oil and definitely sugar. So sugar is, uh, I mean, obviously not to say I don't ever use it, but it is very minimized. And same with salt, because ultimately, as you well know, if you do this, it opens up your taste buds to so many more flavors. And by using some of those, it really, um, I think, dampens um, or overpower some of what you would normally taste. And you just really have to know how to bring the sweetness out of both um, vegetables and fruits. So, Right. Well, you know, I, I, I mean, I know how to bring the sweetness out even without sugar. I have a new, right. I'm going to do a shameless plug. I got a new book coming out this summer, Sweet Indulgence. And oh, that looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Free, yeah, yeah. It's 157 recipes with the fruit, the whole fruit, nothing but the fruit. You can pre-order. I always put the link below. So sure. yeah, that's pretty, I think, I think of sugar oil. Well, I think oil is pretty easy uh, because we can still use fats. You know, you can use right. tahini, you can use avocado and sugar for me is easy. I think the salt is actually the hardest for people. Even if they say, well, I'm a sugar addict. I'm like, yeah, but it's so much easier than salt. It I mean, is. It yeah. is. Well, but, but as you will know, sugar is an addiction, regardless of where you're getting it. So, right. so, and I think so salt I think, for some people, I think salt and fat, I think, I think they're all addictive together. I, I had do. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer on last week for my birthday show. They wrote, they co-wrote the pleasure trap and, and in nature, there is no sugar, fat and salt together. There's no right. sugar and fat together. There's no fat and salt. It's like no food contains all three or two out of the three And the processed food industry must've figured that out. I agree hundred percent. I mean, and it just keeps them coming back for more. It's, it's like any, it's any drug you get that spike, of course, which is insulin spike. And so then you get your low. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the, and of course it's an old documentary, but the, the old supersize me documentary was, was I think a great example of that contrast going from a plant-based diet to your standard American diet. I mean, you saw it transition within a 30 day time frame. I mean, so if that wasn't a, I think a eye opening example for people who watch that, I don't know what could be. So you've got people who've been doing that for decades. So imagine what that does to your body. Yeah. Absolutely. So we have some questions from some of the live viewers. I'll go to Instagram first. And Cycle Michelle asks, do you face people who are too ingrained to even attempt to change? Do I what now? Encounter people. Like sure. maybe, maybe like, you know, they just, you, they, you tell them the, the, what the deal is with their health and they're ah, not interested. Just give me Ozempic. 100%. All the time. So that is, I would say that's a daily encounter. 
um, again, that goes back to expectations. So really with those patients, what you have to find is what's important to them. So everybody has something that's important. So is that their kids, their grandkids, what they want to be around. So you really have to kind of work to find something that touches them deep. And so if you can do that, then you can get some traction with changing that. And so that's usually what I try to do. Now that may not happen in the first appointment, but again, with time, and I think the other thing is, is you've got to, you got to have acceptance, but you also have to have a stance that you can say, well, you can continue to do this, but these are the expectations you, you need to expect. You will have a, a shortened lifespan. You will continue to develop whatever chronic disease are going on at the standpoint, and you may develop new. You heighten your risk of, you know, stroke, heart attack, diabetes. And so, you know, the question is, is does this equate to the quality of life that you want to live? Most people would say no to that. But again, you're going to have your exceptions. But I think I think the important part to that question is, is you've got to find something that's important to that person that they can relate to and then shift what you're trying to do to help them obtain that. And I think sometimes you can break through with that. That is hard, though. Do you have time in your office visits to do that? And Susanna, who's watching live, says, and do you have time to counsel them on food addiction and, uh, you know, sugar, fat and salt? Do you, do you have time to, to figure out what their button is? And Well, sometimes I don't. Um, so that's, you know, again, so what I'll do with those patients is I try to bring them back in a shortened follow up visit, meaning, let's say, within three months. And, you know, work, continually work on them from that standpoint. So I'm heavy, I'm a heavy utilizer of using, you know, handouts, graphics, you know, something to catch their attention. So, you know, it's, it's funny. So I, I referenced the, all the sugar-based beverages I have in my clinic um, and the, qua- you know, the, the equal amount of sugar that would be in that. And so sometimes I'll have patients come back who have lost you know, 10 to 15 pounds. And they tell me, well, you know, I was waiting for you in the exam room. I looked at those sugar bottles and I was shocked at how much was in there. And just that alone, without me even intervening, made the difference. So, so I think the other, I guess, response I would have is, yes, I'm one person. And so I can only achieve so much. That's why I also utilize those types of resources, which are very graphic and visual. And sometimes those are the things that make an impact. Great. A live viewer on Instagram is asking, but if you adopt a plant-based diet, you're giving up animal protein, but how do you get enough protein from eating starches? Well, there's, I mean, that's, that's kind of an old myth that you can't get enough protein in a whole food plant-based diet. So most of my most of my protein, I mean, you can get protein through broccoli. You get a lot of protein through different beans. Um, you can, depending on how you want to use. I mean, obviously, there's difference of opinion if you want to use things like tofu or tempa. So th- those things have that. And I, and I will say protein-wise for me, just because I, I try to, you know, stay in the gym adequate amount of time, I do use some plant-based protein powder. So it just depends what you're trying to accomplish. So, you know, as far as, you know, if you're actively working out, trying to do resistance-based exercise and trying to build muscle mass, sometimes I will utilize um, plant-based protein powders. Um, And some of that is out of convenience. Some of it is I just don't have time to eat enough to get that. So I think that's where I, I, I... I struggle personally is just the time factor. Nice. Thank you. Let's see. Oh, other than you said you go to the gym, you took, do you take your sons? What is your daily or however often you do your exercise routine? So typically I am in the gym four to five days a week. Um, 
And on the days I'm not in the gym, it, I rotate my cardio with that. And some days I do cardio. It just depends. I try to, if I'm going to do it on both days, I'll try to get up early and get my cardio in in the morning. And then I will do my resistance based training when I, when I get home after work. Um, and it just, it just depends. Um, a lot of it will depend. Am I trying to take my son with me? Cause if that's the case, kind of hard to get high school age kids up early enough to go to the gym before school. Uh, that, that is a feat. I don't, <laughs> I don't try to, uh, subject myself to that much. So usually I've got a better chance at, at after, after work. So. Nice. Oh, I find if I don't exercise in the morning, it just doesn't get done. It just, it's doesn't. tough. It is. I agree with that hundred percent. Um, so, uh, Susan Meyer would like to know, do you teach any group nutrition education classes? So that's a good question. Um, I've done a variety of different things. So one of the courses I taught was a chips based course called a uh, complete health improvement program, which is now known as I think Pivio. Are you familiar with that? Yes. I remember do do Dr. Deal before he passed yes. away saying it was being renamed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so now most of that has gone kind of, there's a, the large bulk of that is going to be an online kind of course, but then you will have someone kind of meet with you weekly uh, to, to kind of discuss and kind of, kind of like a lifestyle coach or a nutrition coach. So, so that is, if you're looking for something like that, there are kind of, you know, shared group sessions with different physicians that, that do that. Um, there are things like Pivio, which would be an option. And I, I would say the CHIPS course, I taught that for two years uh, within my community. And I, for a program, I think it's a pretty well-rounded program and very educational. So I did have a really good response from my patients um, when I did that. That's great. I think I saw a question. Just give me a second. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. Did it go. That is so cool. Yeah, if you have questions, whether wherever you're watching, put four question marks. Oh, I know. I remember it was my question. Hello. I, I thought I heard you did something called walk with a doc. Are you still doing that? So that's the other thing. Unfortunately, when I was able to get funding and get that approved, that happened during the pandemic. <laughs> And so I think that was really just bad timing. Um, so that was kind of hard to get people out during that whole period. And so it just kind of, unfortunately, kind of, I think it's a great concept. Um, but that's one of those things that you really have to have participation from other community physicians. Um, and I think that's where the other part was kind of a little bit of a challenge to get engagement from other physicians to take part of that because like any program like that without community kind of support, it's probably not going to be long lived. Are people, are your patients seeking you out because you are plant-based or like, do you advertise on any of the doc, not advertise, but are you listed on any of the sites like plant-based docs or they just walking in and they don't know what they're going to get? No, I, I do get seeked out. Yeah. To answer your question. Yeah. So, um, um, and I have people reach out from outlying communities up to, I guess, three hours away. Um, wow. so, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you can, so, and now with the advent of telemedicine, um, you can, I mean, of course you can't do everything, but it's, it's amazing. Um, what we have access to now from, you know, you can do things relatively remotely. So if I do lifestyle medicine consults, which typically is what that would be, um, they still have their primary care physician. So you can, there is a, I don't know if you're familiar with Rupa Health or Rupa University. Um, so what that is, is basically that is a platform that allows you to pretty much order any lab test you want to, and you can drop ship those orders to anybody, you know, around at least within the continental United States and get those tests done. So so you really about the only thing you can't do is do a physical exam. And obviously a physical exam can be very important. But I think with what we're discussing, 
you can accomplish a lot just with telemedicine and the advent of being able to order tests, regardless of where those people are. So, um, for example, I had a patient come in and, and I think people are seeking those things out, but um, I had a patient come in and we wanted to test them for something that the um, health organization I, I, I'm employed by that um, doesn't have that test. So I just went outside and used Drupa Health and I dropped ship that test to them. They did it just like the food and allergy testing that I do out of the clinic. Um, same thing. I just, I looked for, you know, what my options were outside of that. So, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's, it's wide open in those things. You mentioned that you used to live near me a while back and you were a flight surgeon. What, what did that mean? What does that mean exactly? So I was on an Air Force scholarship through medical school. Um, so as a result, I owed the Air Force three years of active duty service. So I served that out as what's called a flight surgeon. Now, back in the day, um, a flight surgeon was just that. He probably did perform minor surgeries uh, in flight and you know outside of flight. But really what a flight surgeon means today, at least in the Air Force, you're basically a medicine-based doctor with additional training of aerospace medicine. And so you're attached to a squadron or a unit or a base, and you support the pilots and the, um, the supporting ground staff and their families. So, so I would deploy with my squadron to different places over the world, across the world, and support them from a medical standpoint, but I also had additional training in aerospace medicine. So I basically went through a, I guess you could say a miniature pilot training. So I knew what they were experiencing up in the air. Uh, the big thing you worry about is decompression sickness um, with the, the squadron. I was attached to a reconnaissance squadron. Um, it's at Beale Air Force Base, which is just north of Sacramento. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Um, that was another very learning experience. It's, you know, I went into that with, you know, just coming straight out of training and, you know, they expected you to know everything. So if you didn't know it, you better figure it out quick. Um, so it was, it was a good, you know, trial by fire. And it, 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 it really did, I think, help me in multiple different ways. So. Nice. I wish you were back here. I'd have you over for dinner. So one of the viewers named But First Coffee is saying, Fish is packed with protein, vitamins, and nutrients that can lower blood pressure and help reduce the risk of a heart attack or stroke. I'm not sure where you're getting that information, but the question is, why would a person want to give that up? So I think if you just took that for face value, if that was true, then you wouldn't. Um, but I think maybe you might, might need to cite the sources. So currently... A lot of the fish you get is not how you just described it. So there is definitely a high rate of contamination with fish. Um, and, you know, again, I think it's also about expectations. Like I go back to that. So if you're saying I'm eating fish over steak, then I think there's an argument there. If I'm eating fish over pork, I think there's an argument there to a degree. So again, it depends where you're starting, what you're trying to accomplish, you know, what is your health status? Um, but again, I, I think like anything, it's just becomes a choice. But I would say that most of the fish that you buy at the grocery store um, is not healthy. Um, most of the fish, I mean, you can, you know, obviously, the big push would say, well, if I eat salmon, I eat wild Alaskan salmon. And I think at one point that had an argument, but I think due to kind of the environmental pollution, um, I think most of the test, and when you start looking at mercury content, there is an app um, that you can download that's for free that tells you the different mercury content of different fishes, um, especially in, um, you know, sushi is a big, big, following so so again i think it's all in where you're starting what your expectations were where you're coming from originally so maybe you eating fish is a is a positive step um but i would say i don't i don't 
necessarily agree with that that statement. Thank you so much. So I'm guessing you only see people in person and only in Mississippi. Is that correct? Um, currently, that's correct. Okay. Well, so no, no social media, no way to follow you yet. Uh, that I think that's coming, but the, the it's just time is is of the essence with with uh, three three boys, three dogs. Uh, oh, three and, dogs. So now you're speaking my language. I love dogs. Not that I I'm don't a big fan. I'm a big fan. We have we primarily have have had Rhodesian Ridgebacks and. And so um, we have good that. Looking, we have dogs. very good, looking, very good looking dogs. They're they're beautiful dogs. They're great family dogs, and they have great personalities. They like to be part of the family. Um, as all dogs, as all pets should. Yes, be. yes. And then we have Lucy, who is a. Um, she is just, you know, a, you know a mutt of sorts that followed me home from a run one night. Um, we did not plan to keep her, uh, but my wife has a very much a soft heart when it comes to animals and dogs. And the plan was to take her uh, to the local pound the next day to try to find a family. But obviously she never made it. Um, she's still very much part of our family. So, and she has been a, one of the best dogs we've ever had. So um, I, I think, I think animals and especially for our, for us, um, have been very enriching. Um, they're very much part of the family. Lord knows I've made a huge investment in them, uh, in, in multiple ways, but it, it, it has been well worth it. They brought a lot of joy to our lives. So. Nice. Well, thank you for rescuing smart dog for following you home. Last question. <laughs> What's your favorite plant-based documentary and your favorite plant-based book and your favorite plant-based meal? Okay, so I think that um, uh, this is going to be a kind of, this is, those are some tough questions. Um, so I would think, I think for shock exposure, um, I think what the health is good, but I don't, there are some things that I, I have differing opinions in it, but I think if you're looking for shock value, um, that, that kind of opens people's eyes, whether whether they agree with everything and or not, it's kind of like, wait a second. What, I mean, how did, how did that come about? Um, for my younger generation, of course, I like game changers. Uh, that is, that is a great, um, I think a great documentary to really open, open people's mind to like, okay, wow, I could be a elite athlete and still be plant-based. So I think that's, a, I think that was well done. It almost has kind of an MTV vibe to it. Um, and so it's, I think it's, it's a very popular, uh, and I think it was, I think it was well done. Um, my favorite book, Ooh, um, uh, that's going to be tough. Um, so I, I mean, I, I guess I will give credit to the start with the, the China study really started me off. Um, but I think Joel Furman has some great books and so does Michael Greger. So I think between the two, but Dean Ornish has some great, that's a tough one. So I would say I would have to split it between Joel Furman's books and Michael Greger's books. So I, I think they both bring a lot to the table and a little bit of a different perspective. I think you can garner a lot of good knowledge um, out of both. And then my favorite uh, dish, I'm probably you at least... Did do you go to any of the conferences? Have you met any of these people? Yes, like, I've met Michael Greger. Mm -hmm. Like you maybe so go to the American, Lifestyle, American College of Lifestyle Medicine conference or Plantrition, things like that. that. I've been to I've been to both the Plantrition Project. So it was quite a while since I've been to one of those. That was down in San Diego the last time I went, um, and that's where I met him. And then, and of course, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine brings in a whole host of people. Um, so it, it's. Uh, yeah, no, I, it's, it's been, been really good. Um, mm -hmm. Nice. So. Okay. So what's your favorite plant-based meal? So right now I would say I, I've been, I've kind of been stuck on, and this, this may sound uh, not exciting, but the, <laughs> I've been stuck on my, my sweet potato plant, 
black bean burgers for quite a while. That that and, and I think part of it is is they're I think they taste great. They're easily made. I can keep them stocked uh, in the freezer. Um, and so that that along with you know a delectable side salad, I think goes great. Well, great. It was so fun getting to know you. Thank you so much for your passion for healthy eating, healthy living, and instilling it where it needs it the most. Well, thank you for creating a platform to share that with thousands of people. So. Oh, it is my pleasure. And just for being on Chef AJ Live, every first time guest gets two free bottles of California balsamic vinegar and the flavor of their choice, courtesy of Tommy Balsamic. Okay, well... Are you a big balsamic fan? I am, especially when it's reduced and thick and syrupy without sugar and comes in like 30 flavors, including savory ones like curry and jalapeno lime and, and teriyaki. Yeah, I use it instead of oil. So I may send you a bottle of my favorite and I oh, bet wow. you haven't had it. So so um, we'll do we'll do a bottle swap. <laughs> I'm good with that. I think you'll, <laughs> that I think, sounds great. Uh, yeah, sounds good. I'd love to. I'd love to have you over for dinner. So maybe, maybe go back to being a flight surgeon. We'll have fun. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Doctor Rich. Hope you have a great weekend. Thank you, and thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. We will start even earlier tomorrow at eight forty-five a.m. Pacific time for Doctor Shrenik Shah, and he's going to talk about aligning body, mind, and spirit in his journey and adopting a plant-based diet.